it's actually, it really ties very well into what Paul was just talking about, uh, particularly uh, some of the diagrams uh, early on, where he discusses kind of all sorts of different approaches to how you can do it. So I'm going to talk about how we do it uh, at Stamen. So we're, we're a client services business uh, with neither time nor money to work on these things. So uh, we have great aspirations and kind of want to go from there. Uh, first, I'm going to pick this back up again. Um, sorry, it keeps showing up. This is the only slide of a map you'll see in this talk. Uh, this is a project we did last fall uh, it's the, for the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy. Uh, incorporated OpenStreetMap data and incorporated data from the USGS, from the Park Service, from the California Protected Areas database, so on and so forth. And it represented a pretty significant change in how we serve maps. Uh, and it kind of prompted this talk. Uh, it, it, in a lot of ways, this embodies a lot of the best practices we've discovered for our business to serve tiles. <clears throat> So, I mean, I'll, I'll start off by the, the lessons we learned both through this project and some others. So, uh, we discovered that easy deployment is key to effective design iteration. So, if you can show changes to a client five minutes after you talk about it, that's pretty cool. If you can show them 10 options simultaneously anywhere in the world, that's pretty cool. Um, and then as far as actually making that stuff work, um, a lot of it is client facing, but the Parks Conservancy map, for example, is something that, well, I'll get into this in a minute, but we don't really operate, they don't really operate, they're responsible for, I kind of keep an eye on it, but I don't actually have to do anything. And a lot of that is because we shield what's most likely to break, so users don't actually have any sort of negative impact. From, from any sort of downtime on the rendering end. And then repeat this. Uh, since we're a client services practice, we can take the lessons we've learned on one project, apply them to the next project, make them slightly better, move them in a little bit of a different direction, and then just keep doing this. And at this point, we've used this model for about six or seven projects. And it gets better every time. For the last project, we added uh, transparent, uh, well, not transparent, but uh, we added retina tiles. So they just render. It uses the same data. It just doubles the size, doubles the scale, uh, and it works. Uh, we started using uh, vector data tiles when we did the Pinterest map last fall, and that's been super successful. Uh, we've started using vector data uh, on a project earlier this spring. Uh, we had about 50 gig worth of shape files that a client provided, and we were serving those up and caching them, and then doing this design iteration. I think we got up to iteration 27 or something like that. A lot of these were just little refinements, but they wanted to be able to see the, most pre the previous version and then the current version with some minor changes. Um, so, talked a little bit about the services versus, well, about being in a services business. Uh, but because our focus is on doing what's next, um, our website says the next most obvious thing, um, that tends to mean that we need to stay up at the forefront of the cutting edge. And as Dane said earlier, I've been doing a lot with the vector tiles for a while, so we haven't been able to wait for a lot of the features to become public within the Mapbox platform. So we've had to do a lot of these things on our own with the idea of eventually being able to move it to them if it requires scale, or to smooth it out if it's not something that they're going to be able to facilitate. Um, so we host the watercolor maps. Watercolor maps are never going to be hosted by Mapbox for a variety of reasons. Um, Gunderson likes to make fun of us because we make things that don't scale. And that's kind of true. Um, but that's also what a design agency does. So, yeah, we like to push the limits and then see how people can make those, well, bring reality a bit closer to, the, to those limits. Um, and so the other thing about being a services business versus being a service is that for a lot of projects, we give away the infrastructure that we've set up for them and expect them to maintain it, pay for it with as little support as possible from us because it's... It's much better if they can be responsible for their own, uh, for their own uh, destiny. Uh, for others, like, like Pinterest, uh, we actually hand off just the styles and then say, we recommend that you go with a commercial hosting provider because they're a really good fit for you. So with the, with the Parks Conservancy map, it's, a, it's got a lot less traffic, but it's actually a lot more complex than the Pinterest map because it involves all of these different data sources. It's just for the Bay Area. Uh, but it's, uh, it involves three different 
uh, data layers that are rendered from Postgres, and then another raster layer that gets composited at request time, essentially, uh, to to get you the hill shades in the background. So. Um, I think the, the thing that I'd want to sum up there is that because we're a services business, we need to be both strategic and cautious at the same time about how we commit things because they will directly impact us and our clients. So when I was thinking about the infrastructure or the, the goals for the infrastructure to support all of these projects moving forward, um, I started thinking of it in terms of what, what has the least administrative overhead? Uh, where is it straightforward to update data and styles? So if we're working with a GIS manager who's mostly experienced using ArcGIS, how can he update the data layers and uh, have the, the map on the website follow fairly closely behind? Um, what can we do that's cost effective? When we're working for nonprofits, they don't really want to spend more than 50 bucks a month. And they want a lot for 50 bucks a month. And I can say that actually for the Parks Conservancy, it costs them $50 and 76 cents a month, something like that. So that's pretty cool. Um, it needs to be performant. Nobody likes maps that are slow. Uh, it needs to be flexible. We like to, as I say, push the limits. So we need to find ways that we can combine things in ways that we hadn't anticipated before. Uh, so we need to be able to hand it over to clients who have minimal uh, technical capacity to actually maintain these things. So if they don't have to worry about disks failing, that's great. And it needs to be horizontally scalable because if this is something that we want to keep using and we need the flexibility that we can't get by working with a, a platform like Mapbox, we need to be able to scale it easily. And since there are four developers or so, and we share all of the ops responsibilities, any time we spend doing that takes away from any time that we can do production work. So I'm going to take the same slide that Paul had and split it out a little bit more. So these are the conceptual layers that I think of when I look at rendering infrastructure. So the, the topmost and the thing that is closest to the user is ephemeral caching. It's usually in the form of a content delivery network. And that's, that's the thing that is the fastest. That's where the tiles need to come back from the soonest. Uh, and it's also something that you probably pay a bit more for, for those benefits. Uh, it turns out it has other side effects or side benefits at the same time. Uh, there's cache seeding. So he talked a little bit about people who want to uh, pre-render their tiles ahead of time. The, for some projects, we found that it makes, a, makes sense to take a hybrid approach where we render the really popular areas and let the rest fill in as people request them. So if there is a pile-on effect, we will have already rendered the areas for that. And then there's storage of those tiles in a persistent way where we don't have to worry about disks, or disk space. Well, actually, or we don't have to worry about inodes. So we've, um, for maps.stamen.com, uh, we've been rendering that off of a, I think actually a piece of physical hardware, and the on-disk cache doesn't run out of storage. It runs out of inodes, and it starts getting slow, and then eventually when it totally runs out of inodes, you can't log into it, and you have to drive over there and go downstairs and turn it off and turn it back on again, and that's not a good use of anyone's time. Um, so those those are those are important if you're if you need to deal with if you're basically if your ephemeral cache isn't good enough or if you have other really expensive uh, rendering processes. Uh, and then there's the rendering and the post processing part. Um, that's uh, Paul covered a lot of that. That's just the the MapNic piece where you take data from Postgres, take data from shapefiles, take data from MapNic vector tiles, and turn them into raster tiles. Uh, there's also post processing. So last year we launched a product called MapStack that allows you to take take various tile sets from us and from other sources and combine them in new and interesting ways. Originally, it was just going to be a way to uh, split tiles into different functionally separate pieces so that they could be updated independently or data could be squashed in the middle. And then I gave it to one of our design technologists, and he immediately made this thing just blew our mind. So you're going to be surprised by these things. So the flexibility is really important, and treating that as actually a full part of your your rendering tier is really important. And then there's the data part, which Postgres, shapefiles, raster data from USGS, something like that. So I look at this through the lens of the cloud. Uh, before I came to Stamen, I worked at a company where they don't, think, they don't think in terms of individual servers, they think in terms of containers full of servers. And it, 
there's there's been some writing from some of the cloud providers that frame it as a pets versus cattle debate, where pets are individual servers that you take tremendous care to build up, and they have just the right configuration, and they have names. And then there's cattle, where you've got this container full of servers, and if one of your racks goes down, you shouldn't care. And the, the thing that's been really nice over the last probably two or three years is that a lot of the technology that enables the cattle approach to uh, web infrastructure has trickled down to where a 14-person shop can actually make tremendous use of it. So with those requirements and with those concerns spread out, I said, OK, what can we use in the cloud? So I'm going to revisit this slide, and I'm going to let things slide in. I get to use the Anvil transi transition. There's no sound. Um, so for ephemeral caching, as I said, it's a CDN. Uh, there's a bunch of CDN options out there, but for map rendering or for map serving, Fastly is really the only viable option because it's the only uh, it's the only CDN out there that allows you. Or it, it, per it has kind of unprecedented levels of configuration. Uh, they use varnish under the hood and let you edit those varnish configurations directly. So one of the main things that gets in the way of serving map tiles through CDN is that when we've got a web map, we usually request it from four subdomains, A, B, C, and D. And a traditional CDN would treat each of those as a separate request, even if the path was the same. With, with Fastly, you can say, I want to hash by the path only, and all four of those will be exactly the same request. So your hit rate gets way higher. It also allows you to use multiple origin servers, so you can do failover. Um, so that's where the cache seeding and the persistent caching piece come in. And so the cache seeding, this is something that I don't really have a good solution for yet. On the last, the last time we needed to do it, uh, we used Heroku to do the rendering, orchestrated by some simple queuing service, so Amazon's SQS service. Uh, to orchestrate that, and we did it based on uh, meta tiles. So we'd, we would render, it depended on the size of the meta tile, we would render one meta tile at a time and then write it directly into S3. So that when Fastly requested it, it would get a hit the first time. Um, S3 is really great because you don't have to worry about inodes. Uh, you get as much space as you want, and you also get a couple different options in terms of how durable you want your stuff to be. Uh, you, can, you can pay a little bit more, and you can have 11 nines of reliability, or you can pay a little less, and this is data that we're going to potentially throw away anyway, and we can re-render it at any time. Uh, so you can pay for four nines. So that's a pretty good deal. Uh, for rendering and post-processing, we've had really good success with using Heroku for this. Um, I do all of our client uh, kind of demo projects uh, using Heroku these days, uh, where I take a TileMill 2 project in a Git repo and push it directly to Heroku, and then it installs all of the appropriate software to actually serve up those tiles. So within five minutes, it should be less, but right now it's about five minutes, uh, I can go from having a style to seeing a style anywhere in the world and pointing a client at it. And if I do a little bit more work, I can put a cache server in front of it. So if they've got 50 people in their office, I can back it with one Heroku dyno. So it's much smaller than the type of server that Paul's talking about, where you're buying these 24 gig machines. The, uh, a single Heroku dyno has two cores, kind of, and half a gig of RAM, which for rendering is actually OK. Well, at least the stuff we've seen. We've had some projects where the memory usage of MapNIC is sufficiently high that we have to go for 2x dynos, which have a gig of RAM. But the nice thing about that is that if I find out that something has gotten really popular, I can pull out an app on my phone, and I can say, OK, well, we've got one dyno now. We want 10. And five seconds later, we've got 10. So we can scale up and down, and it's charged per second, or per minute. I can't remember. Zeke's over here somewhere. Um, so Amazon is also another option if you are a little bit more cost sensitive and are willing to put the time into doing your upfront setup to get something that is kind of like Heroku, where you treat individ each individual map style as a separate process and just run more of them. So it would be the equivalent to having, say, 10 dynos on a single machine, uh, but you're actually managing that machine yourself. Uh, for data, uh, for... Um, Let's see. So for Postgres, uh, we've been using Heroku Postgres, uh, which supports PostGIS and, Her and Postgres 9.3. 
and has really nice features where you can just automatically have it snapshot. You can set up followers and forks transparently so you never actually have to muck with replication. Uh, the follower capability means that you can resize the databases. Again, those are, those are charged per second or per minute, so only for the time you need. So if you're doing a massive import, you can, load, you can, you can buy one of the $6,400 a month databases and use it for a week and then shut it down. Um, we use Amazon for the same purpose. Amazon's got their RDS service, which is essentially the same. It, it, it's a little bit newer, uh, but as far as I can tell, it's, uh, it's not quite as operationally sound because you have to use a web interface and you can't script it quite as much of it. Uh, Amazon is also really useful if you've got some shape files. Uh, so for this, this project I was talking about before where we had 50 gig of shape files, uh, I was running that on an EC2 instance with two 40 gig SSDs that were mirrored together, or that were striped together, uh, so that I could have fast random access to it. And when the project ended, I shut it down. Uh, so the other piece is Mapbox. Mapbox publishes some really useful uh, vector data tiles. So Mapbox Streets, Mapbox Outdoors. Um, we use that for prototyping primarily. Well, sorry, we use that for prototyping first. We don't use anything else for prototyping unless there's something that really uh, makes it necessary. Because uh, it's a really good way to sketch out ideas and potentially have it in a position where you can hand it off to them for rendering. Um, we're going to start doing more with data tiles. Uh, a current project, we're using uh, Hadoop to generate, I think, about 35 gig of point data uh, as vector data tiles. And then right now, serving that off of another EC2 instance, because it needs to be on disk somewhere, uh, and then rendering it using Heroku. But since there's so much data, this is where we run out of memory. Right, so kind of all over the place. Um, the thing I think I forgot to say about the persistent caching is that uh, the persistent caching layer is actually implemented as a teeing reverse proxy. So a request comes in, the reverse proxy requests it from the render node, and as it passes back out through the, through the reverse proxy, it gets written into S3 so that Fastly will get it from there the next time, or another Fastly node will request it from there. So here's what I'm going to talk about ephemeral caching, edge caching. I'm going to talk about Fastly a little bit more, but I'm going to be kind of quick about it. Um, so beyond the things that I was talking about before, Fastly has support for surrogate control headers, which are the uh, edge cache version of a browser's cache control header. So you can say, hey, Fastly, I only want the browser to cache this for five minutes, but I'm pretty sure that it's not going to update within a month. So you can set a month timeout on there, and maybe it'll fall out of cache, maybe it won't. And this is great if you've got a completely static data set, but it actually works for dynamic data sets as well because they have surrogate keys, which are a list of tags that you can associate with any object. So you can say this is for Zoom 4, this is for the toner style, um, maybe it was created on some date. Uh, and then when you want to purge, you can say I want to purge all toner tiles. And you can make a single request and it will drop everything associated with toner. Or I only want to drop Zoom 4 because I found the Great Lakes. Something like that. Um, watercolor actually was missing them for a while. So that was, that's kind of a fun story. If, I'll talk about that later. Um, so that way, if you're running uh, a replicated uh, planet, repl or sorry, if you're running a planet replica and you generate the uh, tile invalidation, or sorry, if you generate the list of tiles that have been invalidated, you can you can purge them individually, or if they fall into some more general category, you can use that to purge. Um, so there's cache seeding. I'm going to totally hand wave over this. Um, you can either write some custom code with a queue or not a queue, or you can just make a bunch of requests through your web tier, uh, like you were just pretending to be a bunch of users, and that'll fill it. Uh, persistent caching, why render things that are unchanged more than once. Pretty much talked about this. Uh, we talked about the teeing HTTP proxy. The other thing is the combination of fast and S3 means that if your rendering tier is down for, let's say, three weeks, I'm not saying that it has been, but if it is down for three weeks and you're using a 28-day TTL uh, within Fastly, or even longer, actually, if you decide to turn off your rendering infrastructure, um, is probably a better way of point, putting it. Uh, the combination of Fastly and S3 will ensure that most of your users won't notice because all of the popular stuff is already coming off of, off of disk, off of, off of S3. Um, 
while looking for slides for this, um, if you look for tile floors on Flickr for Creative Commons photos, there are a lot of people that like taking pictures of their floors. It's kind of weird. Um, yeah, go figure. Um, so the, the other piece here where you're rendering from vector data tiles or you're post-processing things like map, uh, like map stack, where map stack is pulling multiple tiles from somewhere else, you just treat it at the top of this as though it's another client. And you can use exactly the same architecture to shield whatever your data source is. Um, data, Paul went into a lot of that. Dan went into a lot of that. Uh, the, the thing that I haven't figured out yet is what the best way to deal with raster data is. So if you've got, say, a, tr a terrain map or a map of sea level rise where you're processing rasters and need to serve them out from somewhere, uh, when you're not dealing in a world where you have a single server, where does that data live from? How do you, how do you pull it? And I suspect that that's one of the reasons that the Mapbox outdoor tiles are actually a vector data set, is that that's much easier to deal with as a service. You can, you can distribute it. Well, I guess it's coming out of S3 fundamentally. Uh, yeah, so I don't know, that's something that I, I don't really have any good ideas on yet. So if you do, let me know. Um, yeah, and the, the features that, that Dane's talking about with being able to composite vector data sources are really powerful. Uh, for Pinterest, we wanted to incorporate the, the, ve the vector terrain layer, and it was just cake. It was amazing. And I really look forward to doing more with that. Uh, for, this, for this project with all the point data, uh, it has radii associated with each of the points. And by default, it's sorted largest to smallest so that you can draw them over one another. But I wanted to try out a rendering where where the markers bumped each other out of the way. So I wrote a little Java thing that um, takes uh, protobufs and then reverses the sorting of the features within an, individu within an individual layer. And it's just, it's, if you think of everything as plumbing and everything as pipes, you can combine things together in all sorts of new and interesting ways, and you get that flexibility that I talked about at the beginning. So if I've gone on too long and you didn't pay attention, the key to effective design iteration is being able to deploy things over and over very easily and for anyone to do it. Uh, shield what's likely to break so you can turn off your rendering infrastructure and no one will ever notice. You can go on vacation and not have to worry about your pager ringing because it's Amazon's problem and it's Fastly's problem and it's Heroku's problem. Keep doing this stuff because it gets better and it, it improves over time. It gives us new capabilities and the stuff that we try out and hand over to a designer or a technologist and just see how they think about it a little, just a little bit differently, but they come out with something just absolutely fascinating. Uh, Fastly is really great, really great, really great. I, I can't say enough good things about them. Uh, they've got points of presence all around the world. Um, I think there are two areas that they're weakest right now are Africa and South America, but I've got, I guess they've got a Brazil pop coming online. Um, AWS and Heroku, uh, you can treat them as servers, but you can also treat them as the cloud, and you can be really effective and strategic about how you do it, and it doesn't cost a whole lot of money. Uh, a lot of people level criticism at Heroku as being really expensive. It's not. If you follow their guidelines for splitting up your app or splitting up your map into individual components, you actually end up paying less. Uh, so Dane also alluded to this. Um, the core piece of this uh, at this point is a tile server called Tessera. So tiles in Greek or something like that. I can't remember. Um, here I'm showing off my ignorance. Um, so this is a, a node-based tile server that actually does nothing more than route requests to other providers that can return vector data tiles, raster data, JSON data, CSVs, anything that can be tiled. Uh, and yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of key to what we're doing. Uh, I've been doing a lot with Tile Live uh, that uh, Young over there designed a few years ago, and it's like really or. Uh, Constantine, um, it's no okay. Someone over at Mapbox, thank you. Um, it's kind of an untapped resource. Uh, there's just the way of thinking about things, the way of registering uh, resources for tile mill sources, tile mill styles, styles, cardo sources, bridges, CSVs. It's just it's great. You can do all sorts of crazy stuff with it. Um, and the other thing here is not actually toilet paper, but is the team reverse proxy that we be use. Uh, it's not awesome, but it works. Um, we run it on a single. Heroku Dino, and it handles all of maps.salmon.com, and I don't actually ever worry about it. 
thank you very much. Um, I think I do have time for questions because there's a break. So, sweet.